Uh, Hemet has, has appeared on CNN and Fox News, which I think all of you know based on that response. Uh, he's, he's served on the board of directors for Foundation Beyond Belief and the Secular Student Alliance. He has written multiple books, including I Sold My Soul on eBay and the Young Atheist Survival Guide. I always like to talk about how he sold his soul on eBay when I'm tabling because I, I, I always think that's a wonderful conversation to have with people. It's so much fun. Many conversations yesterday while I was tabling for Earth Day. Um, he also edited the book Queer Disbelief. Um, he is a uh, been featured on Fox News, CNN, Wall Street Journal. He's actually been on the CFFC's Free Thought Cruise. He now blogs for Only Sky. Um, you don't have to remember that. Just look for the friendly atheist, and you won't miss him. Um, and I believe he's more involved in more than that. He's actually working with the podcast and content development for Only Sky. Uh, and on that blog, Hemet has been very generous in his coverage of our work as an organization, having featured the CFFC in our activism more than 40 times in the past, past 10 years. So please join me in thanking and welcoming the friendliest atheist I know, Hemet Meta. Uh, I will tell you, I have, you're the guinea pigs for this talk, because I have not given it before, so I hope it's okay. I have no idea how long it is. We could be here for hours. Uh, many thanks to David and Jocelyn and CFFC. If you have the ability to donate, please do. If you have the ability to volunteer or go to the meetups, please do. It's such an important group, and all the work they do is really amazing. Um, Thank you all for coming here. Two caveats before I start. One is, I'm talking about optimism, which is weird for me because I'm very cynical in general. Uh, these are not a lot of, of fully formed ideas, and if you have thoughts on if I got something wrong, please tell me afterwards. And the other part of that is, like, I know things look bleak in a lot of ways. I know we are in Florida right now. <laughs> like, I don't want to downplay any of the bad stuff, but I'm going to try to focus on some of the good stuff. So I'll tell you a little brief history of just where I'm coming from, and maybe it resonates with some of you, uh, because for most of us, I think we were not raised as non-religious. We became non-religious. And in my case, um, that was in high school. This is like when I started questioning my religion. And the only way I knew to try to find answers to what happens if you have doubts about God is going online, and at the time we're talking like AOL dial-up. <laughs> um, so wait till parents are sleeping so that we can use the phone line, get online, type in like AOL search key, like what happens if you don't believe, because I did not know the word atheist. And the only thing that comes up is like shady websites from dudes who clearly live in a basement somewhere and rant about God in their spare time. And the thing is, like, the stuff I was seeing, it made sense. And I'm like, oh no, the creepy people in the basement make sense. <laughs> and so after, that was early high school when I got to college, I started an atheist group. I got connected with some national atheist groups, and that was exciting because these people are passionate about the same thing I'm passionate about, because, like, it's Becoming an atheist for me was like one of the only things, only times in my life, I think, where I felt like I made a big decision or I figured something out, and it's not because anyone around me told me to do it, I just kind of worked it out for myself. And I'm passionate about it, and here I was starting to work with groups that were equally passionate about these things. Um, so that's kind of my foray into atheist activism, and all of this stuff happened in like the late 90s, early 2000s for me. So imagine my surprise in like the mid 2000s when it turns out like a lot of people start expressing interest in this thing I thought I was only passionate about and a handful of other people. And that is when these books started coming out, like The God Delusion, the Sam Harris books, all that stuff. And they basically called it like the new atheism. And I think for a lot of people who had not thought about these questions, or were not given permission to question religion, that was kind of an opportunity to realize, oh, it's okay to ask these questions and have your doubts. Um, so over the next several years, like I'm, I'm telling you, people were talking about it, there was kind of a burst of activism in different ways. And then for the past several years, it seems like it's 
gone, it seems like it's disappeared. Or at least relatively speaking, people don't talk about it like they used to. The interest is not there like it used to. And I was trying to figure out, how do you quantify any of that? Can I show you that it used to be popular and now it's not? And here's one version of that. This is like the Google Trends for new atheists. And you can see like, if this red, yeah, you can see, this is like 2006 when the God Delusion comes out. That's when people were looking up new atheists, and this is today. Like, and this is just relative popularity. So it's just gone down over time, which makes sense, because why would anything be popular over that long period of a time? And maybe you're thinking, well, that's specifically new atheists. What about like new atheism or some variant? It's the same trend. And then maybe you're thinking, well, that's a very specific thing, and it's in quotation marks. What about atheism? Like, without quotes, just are people talking about that? You can see the red and blue lines down here. Like, relative to those, people actually look up atheism, and even that has gone down over time. All of that is to say, there used to be, like, a lot of interest in the topic, and over time, it has decreased. And that seems bad, or at least that seems like people don't care about it, or they're not questioning stuff, or maybe religion wins, who knows? Um, okay, here's another way to quantify the same thing. Last week I took a screenshot of the most popular atheist books on Amazon, and I'm telling you, like, this is not an anomaly. This is pretty standard if you look any time in the past couple of years, and what you find, like, what are the most popular books today for people who look up anything involving atheism? And here's what's surprising. Like, there's God's Not Great, and so is that, and so is that. Because there are different versions of the same book. Like, God Delusion appears a couple different times in different formats. Like, half the books on the Amazon bestsellers list for atheism are still the new atheist books that came out like 15 years ago. And there's a couple books on this list that are Christian rebuttals to the things those atheists wrote 15 years ago. And there's a couple of items on here which are like newer books, uh, like Seth Andrews wrote one recently, Andrew Seidel. There's a couple books that are new. The question is, well, will anyone care like a year or two after those books come out? Do they have lasting power? I don't know. But I think this says a lot about like, how do people who are strangers, who want to learn about atheism, how, what do they encounter? if they're starting to search and look up this stuff. And it's still very much defined by like whatever the new atheists, quote unquote, said 15 years ago. Which is to say we haven't, it doesn't look like we've made any changes or progressed. We're still stuck where we used to be. Um, which is strange. One other measure is like conferences. This is in 2012, they did this Reason Rally in Washington, D.C., supposedly like the largest gathering of atheists in U.S. history. This is like 20 or 30,000 people on the mall in Washington, D.C. Uh, that is my picture. I think that's Dawkins speaking, and that's, you can see, it's people as far as the eyes can go. They tried doing it again in 2016 before the election that year, and it's just, it wasn't as populated. <laughs> I don't have an estimate count for you, but I was there and it did not look as crowded. And there's a, it's not an apples to apples comparison here. There's a lot, like it would take another talk to tell you why I think this didn't go as well as the last one. But needless to say, like the excitement that was there in 2012 wasn't there as early as like 2016. Um, I think anecdotally, speaking to like conference organizers, it's the same thing when the new atheist stuff was happening. Events like this would get a ton of people. Conferences would get hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of people. And it's been harder to generate excitement for those same events. And that's outside the pandemic. So like, it's, it seems like there's less and less interest. Um, and I would even say like, we'll talk about this guy in a second. Um, <laughs> even things like mainstream coverage of atheism. You used to see like debates about religion and religious issues on places like Fox News, and even they stopped doing that. And you would think that's kind of their bread and butter. 
they stopped inviting atheists by and large on their shows, I think because they realized we can just talk about you, we don't actually need you there. Um, which is to say it's a lot harder to get our ideas out to people who aren't actively looking for them. And one last example, no picture, just I came into this movement in a way by writing about atheism and my thoughts about atheism. And at the time when all this was happening, there were so many blogs, websites about atheism. And speaking for myself at least, it looks like the number of websites that have secular content explicitly has kind of gone away. The passion for writing about it has gone away. Any advertising revenue that used to come in for people who were writing about it has gone away. So again, I say all that to say like, it seems like all the stuff we were excited about for years is not as popular as it used to be. And this is, I swear, this is a talk about optimism. I'm getting that. <laughs> um, okay, with all that out of the way, here's why I'm, I think, despite everything I just told you, we're actually in a better position than we used to be 15 years ago. That's where I'm going with this, okay? Here's a couple ways I can try to quantify it. I'm gonna to try to give you three reasons I think things are better off. One is all the demographic changes have pretty much moved in our direction as non-religious people. This is uh, from a couple of years ago, but this is from the Pew Research Center, and you can see this is uh, people who identify as Christians. Uh, starting in 2007 and all the way to 2021, it's gone down. It's at 63% of people identify as some brand of Christianity. Meanwhile, the people who claim no religion has gone from like 16% up to 29, virtually doubling since that time. So even though it's less popular as a thing, more people are kind of running away from organized religion as a whole, which seems like a good thing. Um, this is an interesting chart. This is from a sociologist, uh, Ryan Burge, but he's tracking the percentage of people of different ages who are religiously unaffiliated this is like silent generation, greatest generation, and you could see from like 1998 to now, more of them say they are religiously unaffiliated. A low number to be sure, but it's more than it was before. What about the boomers? Yeah, even that's going up. Generation X, they started a little higher, but even that's on the upswing. And maybe you're wondering what about even younger than that, millennials, Here's the millennials for you. <laughs> Started non-religious, heading up of non-religious. Like, for a younger generation, organized religion is just less of a thing you do. And I know that varies depending on where you live and what communities and families you're in. But by and large, like, the work of so many atheist activists for years of normalizing questioning religion and normalizing atheism, like, if you go to a large public high school, it's virtually, you can't swing your arms without running into someone who's not religious. Which is, I mean, when you have friends who might not be religious, it's a lot easier for you to say, okay, I have some doubts. Again, I know there are exceptions to that rule. There are red states, there are red seas and red, uh, blue states. Like, I know that is different, but the, the environment that the younger generation, younger I mean like under 30, uh, is growing up in is just vastly different than the one older people grew up in. And this may be my most like favorite way of looking at the same thing. This is a chart that shows how many people ever have doubts about their belief in God. Obviously, most of the people in this room have a lot of doubts <laughs> about God. But you would think, okay, well, the majority of America is religious, and you would think a lot of those people, um, how confident are they that God exists? Um, and this chart is basically, uh, these are people who said, I know God exists, and I have zero doubts about it. If you read The God Delusion, there was like that spectrum of like one means you know for a fact God exists, and no one should be on there. But like there are people who put themselves at a one, and then like theoretically, if you say, I know for a fact God does not exist, you're at a seven, and Dawkins in the book said, I'm at a six maybe a 6.9, like, because he couldn't say seven. But these are the people who say, I'm at a one, 
I know God exists, I have zero doubts about it. Check out what's happened in, this is 1988 at the beginning right there. We're talking like uh, 60 some percent of Americans say I have zero doubts. And that's like 80% believe in God. And just about all of them say, no, I'm 100% sure I'm right. That's where we are now. And this made news because for the first time ever, fewer than half of all Americans <coughs> now say I'm 100% sure God exists. So even the most religious people among us <coughs> have some doubts, which creates an opening for people to keep going there. So here's the question, like, all of these moves are heading in the direction of, like, away from organized religion, away from certainty about God. Why is that good for us, necessarily? Like, what have we won here? And why is this happening? Especially if all the popularity about atheism happened, like, 15 years ago, why is the trend still continuing in that direction? And Phil Zuckerman, who's a sociologist, wrote this, uh, a book, and he wrote this article for Salon, I think this highlights a large part of it. Um, staunch atheists show higher morals than the proudly pious on everything. And this is just one paragraph from the article, but I want to read it to you to make sure you like see this. In terms of who supports helping refugees, affordable health care for all, accurate sex ed, death with dignity, gay rights, trans rights, animal rights, as to who opposes militarism, the government use of torture, the death penalty, corporal punishment, and so on, the correlation remains. The most secular Americans exhibit the most care for the suffering of others. While the most religious, <laughs> while the most religious exhibit the highest levels of indifference. Or to put that another way, it's so easy to spot religious hypocrisy. And if you're looking for like who's doing the right thing, <laughs> on so many issues that are of massive importance for so many people, it looks like the people without organized religion have it right. <laughs> well, so many religious people who claim to have the moral high ground do the exact opposite. And I just want to highlight a couple of these for you here. This is, um, do you think abortion should be legal all or most of the time? The dark blue there in the middle, this is all of America. And I know it's hard to see, but it says 57% of people, most Americans, say, yeah, we should have legalized abortion. It should be a right. We should have access to it. Um, where are atheists on this list? We would be way up there in terms of saying that says 87% of atheists, not nuns, but atheists, 87% say, yeah, it should be legal. The only group beating us up there is uh, Unitarian Universalists. <laughs> um, but again, on this huge issue, which is gonna be an even bigger issue in a few months, if the Supreme Court does what everyone thinks the Supreme Court's gonna do, there are gonna be people saying, who's fighting for like reproductive rights? Atheists are damn near at the top of that list. And it's the religious like conservatives who are saying, no, we wanna control bodies. What about trans rights? Same thing basically happens there. This is uh, a survey from a couple of years ago that says, do you believe your gender is uh, determined the moment you are born? Doctor looks at genitalia, says you're a boy, you're a girl, we're done. You cannot change your gender ever. And the percentage of, look at this, white evangelicals, 84% of them say, yup, whatever the doctor said, that's it for life. And that also means they're gonna oppose uh, trans rights. They're probably gonna oppose the very idea that trans people exist because they think that can't possibly be a thing. Versus, where are atheists on this list? Only 29% say that. And I know that's like still a big number, but compared to everyone else, it's basically saying, when it comes to trans rights, acknowledging their humanity, we're the ones doing that. Same deal happens with the death penalty. Who's for, I'm sorry, who's against the death penalty here? You can see here, when it comes to uh, white evangelicals, uh, where is that number right here? 75% um, of white evangelicals are either somewhat or strongly for the death penalty. Whereas, we're atheists on this list, there we are, 65% say no in some capacity. 
So should the government be allowed to execute people? We're the ones on the moral side of that. You can punish them in other ways, is what atheists are saying. And one last one here, um, COVID. Should you, this is right before the vaccines became available to people. Will you get a vaccine? I absolutely will, or I probably will. Check this out, white evangelicals. 54% say they'll get vaccinated. 45% say I probably won't. Which, you know what that implies. That implies I don't care about other people's health. I don't care about my own health. I don't care about the science. I don't care what the experts say about it. Versus what do atheists say? 90% said, yeah, I'm gonna get my vaccine. I mean, on, this is what Zuckerman is getting at. All of these issues that are at the forefront of so many headlines these days that are moral issues, that are culture war issues, it's atheists and non-religious people by and large who seem to be caring about other people, who want to empathize and express tolerance and dignity for other people and it's the religious side, and I, I know it depends on which religion and what we're talking about, but by and large religious conservatives oppose all that stuff. And if you don't care about atheism or you don't think about God, you could still look at all of these things and be like, well, I can't follow those people taking the religious road because I see where it leads them. And again, that is what's happening now, even though when we talk about atheism, that peaked a long time ago. Here's another thing that this has led to. Um, for a long time, I remember hearing a lot of atheist activists complaining about how we don't know anything about our own community. And the reason is, even when they did surveys, we were always an asterisk. Because there were so few open atheists taking these surveys that it's like, well, what do atheists think about you know, the election or this issue? And it's like they had to lump us in with agnostics and people who believe in eh, something, but maybe not an organized religious label. That's why we have the label the nuns, because like they're not enough to break that apart. And the thing is, there are more people using non-religious labels of different stripes these days, which makes it easier for researchers to figure out what we're like. Because it sounds like from those like surveys, it seems like we're pretty monolithic. And we're not. On a bunch of different things, we're not. We do have different experiences, but until there was like a critical mass of people, we were unable to figure out what we are uh, differing on. And like this year, uh, American Atheists released what they called like a secular survey. Uh, what does it mean to be non-religious in America? They worked with researchers to say like, what does our community look like? And among the things they've already released, they found that, for example, Participants who have unsupportive parents, if they became non-religious but their parents did not like it, there were 70, they had a 71% higher rate of depression compared to people whose parents gave them the space to explore that stuff. Another thing they found, a third of participants in the survey, 29%, said they had negative experiences in school because of their non-religious identity. And again, maybe that doesn't mean that much on its own, but that now gives researchers the chance to explore those issues in a way we've never been able to do before. We couldn't do that 10 years ago. We are starting to do that now. Um, this is like the University of Kent, um, I think in the UK. They did this a couple years ago too. It's called Understanding Unbelief. They put money and research and time into figuring out what's up with all these non-religious people. What can we learn about them? They actually did projects concerning like, how do atheists deal with the end of life? How do they approach it differently from religious people? How is secular meditation like religious belief? Are they the same? Are they different? How do atheists approach morality? Like they're trying to ask interesting questions and dive into those issues. That was phase one. They're actually starting phase two with different questions this coming year. And again, they could not do this like as recently as a few years ago. They just didn't have the numbers. Now they do. Now they can dig in and figure out what's going on with our community. Um, and I know uh, David mentioned this earlier. This is a cheap plug on my end. <laughs> but I'm telling you, for several years, if you were looking for like atheist bloggers or whatever, there were a few different blog networks, websites you could go to, and most of them 
have either died off or they are like very small compared to what they used to be. And this is a site I now work with right for called Only Sky. And here's the thing I just want to mention about this. They made it clear that their mission is we're just going to assume you're non-religious. You don't have to waste any time defending why you are an atheist. Let's just go into this assuming that the people coming to this site are non-religious, and now let's go from there. What's interesting to you using atheism or whatever label you use as a starting point? Which means there are articles on the site, you can go at any time, but like there are articles about music and movies and books, and it's coming from a secular perspective where you don't have to justify why you're not religious all the time, which I think is a huge change for the better from all the, like just rehashing the same Atheism 101 arguments all the time, which is a lot of what you used to find online. Um, I think here's what all this means. We are moving past the word atheist. Uh, the focus of activism by a lot of groups and communities is not, I want to make you an atheist. It's, I want, we used to fight about like, destigmatizing the word. We used to fight about making sure we're accepted or trying to bolster those counter-apologetic arguments. And I, those things are important. They're always new to somebody. But now it's a lot more about fighting religious bigotry and Christian nationalism. And those are not things unique to our community. Those are unique to so many religious communities as well, because they don't like it any more than we don't like it. So all the things we by and large care about now, we have a lot of support coming in from other spaces. And also, this is the other thing, when it comes to resources available, like I'm telling you, when I was questioning my faith for the first time, I found the shady dudes in their basements, their websites, but now if you have questions about your faith, there are so many opportunities to hear about it, learn about it, explore that stuff in a private way, in an anonymous way, there are books, obviously, but there are websites, you name the medium, and there are places you can go to. Like, there are so many opportunities to learn about this stuff. And that wasn't there in the past, which is also amazing. I mean, that is the work of generations of activists and organizers to get that stuff out there. And I think on that front, making sure like our material is out there, we won that battle. That's like from Marilyn Murray O'Hare to now, people have put that stuff out there and it's easy to find. People are translating works in different languages to make sure anyone around the world can find it. That is amazing. That also means we get to stop playing defense when it comes to people stigmatizing atheists and saying like, no, 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 here's why you're wrong about God. It means we can take that, run with it, and play offense and fight back against what other people are doing. Okay. All of that was like the demographic changes. That's one thing I am optimistic about. Are you with me on that front? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Here's the second thing uh, that makes me optimistic. I mentioned like conventions and rallies seem to be going down in size, which means maybe there's less interest in any of the stuff that a lot of the people in this room are passionate about. And that seems bad. But here's why I don't think that's a bad thing. What's amazing is I think the number of communities for people who are not religious has actually grown in number. You just don't see them all in the same places. And that's the big change here. Like, they don't get a lot of media attention, they are not big, and yet they might be more influential for the sort of things all of us, most of us seem to care about. And that's because instead of one group or a couple of big nonprofit groups having to try to be everything to everyone, we've all kind of branched out. We know who the target audience is, and that is more helpful to people. I'll give you some specifics, but like, I think I liken this to college. If, for those of you who attend college or want to attend college, you never just say, I want to go to college. That means nothing. That's like going to a restaurant and saying, give me a sandwich. Doesn't, you gotta be more specific than that. And that's the same thing with college. Like, it depends. Do you want to go to a big school or a small school? Public, private. Do you want to go to one where you're living on campus or not? Maybe you care about cost or size or whatever. And for a long time, pre-internet, there was kind of the one-size-fits-all brain of atheism. Maybe there was a book written by some academic. Wasn't really fun to read, but that's all you got. With the new atheism books, even then, it's like, okay, there's, I'm just going to use God Delusion as an example of it. 
the whole, it's a book. So if you want to learn about like why God isn't real or why religion is wrong, there's the arguments against God's existence, take it or leave it. It's very much a one size fits all. It has to be. It's a book. I'm not mad about it. Like, what other choice do you have? But here's the thing. Now, what when I was involved in like organized atheism and, and a lot of these organizations, a lot of the infighting that we had, a lot of the debates we were trying to figure out is, well, okay, that sort of book is great for a certain type of person. And that's nice. But like atheists of color have different experiences than white atheists. Younger atheists, who might be surrounded by other like less religious people, have different experiences and interests than older people who might have grown up in a very religious community. And like, are we addressing all of that? Um, so here's the thing though. One group cannot address all of that stuff. Some of them have tried. They've done amazing things to try and reach out to other people, but like they can't do everything. One group can't do everything. And like, how do you accommodate everyone's needs? It's really hard. Um, and you can't do it without leaving people out. But here's how that's changing, I think. Um, how many of you are familiar with this guy on the left here? Raise your hand if you know him. Couple people. That guy's name is Lloyd Evans. He's a former Jehovah's Witness. I'm telling you, I've gone to like after parties for things like this, or I've been in communities where like people will tell me they came out of religion or something. And of course, my first question is like, what religion did you come out of? This is all I want to talk about now. And if I've, I've had this conversation, they said we were former Jehovah's Witnesses. Interesting. Have you heard of Lloyd? Their eyes lit up. You know Lloyd? Everyone who's a former Jehovah's Witness knows Lloyd. But I'm guessing most of the people in this room, if you weren't part of the uh, Witnesses, are like, okay, who is he? Because he serves a very specific community. He's a former Jehovah's Witness who on YouTube these days talks about controversies within the JW community, talks about the things the church, the, the Jehovah's Witness Temple, like, puts out and says, here's what they said, here's why it's wrong, here's why it's a problem. And if you're a former Jehovah's Witness, that is more interesting to you than what you're going to find in, like, a Dawkins book. It's speaking to you personally. They know what you went through. That's a big deal. How many of you are uh, familiar with this guy? Couple people. His name is John DeLynn. He is a former Mormon who now does the same thing but addresses Mormon controversies and talks to people who have left the church. He has a podcast called Mormon Stories Podcast. Same conversation, I swear. If someone tells me they used to be a Mormon, do you know who John is? They all know who John is. Because a lot of the reason they left the Mormon church may have been through him. Or that's what they found when they decided they wanted to leave. And all of a sudden, here's a guy who knows everything they went through and not only addresses it, but he's talking about stuff happening in the church today. And I'm not saying this to like trash Dawkins. Dawkins can't do that. He doesn't know the specifics like this guy does. And I'm not saying there's no drama involved in those communities as well. There's drama in every community. But I'm saying like that guy and people like him speak more to the former Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses than that. This happens across the board. Uh, this is Ellie who runs uh, uh, X Fundy Diaries on YouTube, a former fundamentalist Christian who does a lot of the same stuff. Way more interesting to listen to because she knows that stuff. Um, this is Abraham Piper. And if you don't know him, you might know his father, John Piper, who is like a super conservative Baptist preacher um, Abraham here, his son, super popular on TikTok. Um, I want to play you this video. I hope the audio works here. My son had to wear a tie the other day, and I asked if he needed help. And of course, his answer was, I don't want to tie a tie, Dad. Which was news to me, because he's never really had a reason to wear one. I remember exactly when and why I learned to tie a tie. I was 10, and I was going on a missions trip by myself. What's a missions trip, you ask? It's a white savior's evangelical vacation that other people pay for. And your guys are doing it requires dressing up on Sundays and whenever interacting with the public. That's the need to tie my own tie. This requirement was alongside memorizing the KJV, not talking to girls, and running a mile every morning. Oh, <laughs> guess where the mission strip was too? One of the darkest places on earth. Florida! <laughs> <laughs> I 
ten-year-old me and my cohort of other pre-adolescents took the message of Jesus and his ghastly demise to Orlando. I mean, if I guess who's going to get bathed in the blood of the Lamb, I would put my money on Florida, man. It's not even a story. Tying a tie, missions trip, Florida. I, I don't know. Suffice it to say, I look dapper as fuck doing my DC Talk puppet shows. <laughs> All right, this is getting way too niche. I gotta go. He <laughs> puts out like hundreds of these on TikTok. And again, if you're coming from that sort of environment where going on mission trips and doing all that stuff was something you did, no wonder he's popular. And no wonder a lot of people who were not part of that uh, youth do not watch that sort of thing. Why would they care? It's not speaking to their experience. But I'm going from someone like Dawkins or Sam Harris and Hitchens or something to a bunch more of people like these who speak to individual communities and know all this stuff is so much more influential and effective and it reaches so many more people than just the one type of religion is bad, religion poisons everything, which a lot of people might see. And if, the, if you come out of that for a second and think, well, my church did a lot of good, which is probably true. And you see that on the title of the book, it's like, I'm not taking this guy seriously. But then you hear one of these people saying, oh yeah, I remember when I went on my like Mormon church mission trip for a couple of years, and here's what happened to me, and here's why I'm no longer believing in that stuff. It's, you know why that's more effective. They know you, they can speak to you, they know your language, and they're speaking to you from that perspective. That's a big deal. Um, I don't know how many of you know this, like uh, Reddit atheism, has nearly three million members, which that sounds way more impressive than it actually is for a bunch of reasons. This may be the largest forum online for to discuss atheism. And you could totally make fun of it because it's a lot of like childish memes, yes, serious articles, a lot of people saying like, you guys, my religious relative just said this. And it's like, dude, we know we've all been there. There's a lot of that. But I want to highlight just one thing. There's a section right up here, if you ever visit Reddit Atheism, and it's called the X Group. And this is where all the interesting conversations actually happen. These are like, there are sections for ex-Catholics, where are we, there we are, ex-Catholics, ex-Muslims, ex-Jews, ex-Mormons, uh, ex-Hindus, ex-JWs, Jehovah's Witnesses, ex-Baha'is. Where are you going to find specific content criticizing every religion? That's the short list, by the way. Full list, you have to click over there because there's so many of them. That's where the real conversations are happening because you get to talk to your tribe and the people who left your tribe. And I'm telling you, if you ever want to just lurk, go to those communities and check it out because their conversations make no sense to a bunch of people, but everyone involved totally knows what they're talking about. My personal favorite is uh, a version of this, it's called uh, Fundy Snark Uncensored, which just rips apart like fundamentalist Christianity, purity culture, all that stuff. And they watch all the quiverful families, like the Duggars being the most famous, but, they, but there's so many more, and they all do it on social media. And they watch these people and they're like, what are they doing? Look what they just did. Is it petty and spiteful? Totally, and it's so glorious. Um, <laughs> and by the way, it's not just on these sites, it's not just Reddit, it's not YouTube. I mean, this stuff is happening on TikTok, it's happening on websites, it's happening in whatever medium you want. There are people out there speaking that language, and we're talking about the stuff that only a handful of people ever got attention for talking about years ago. Huge change, that's amazing. Oh, by the way, Fundy Stark Uncensored, 100,000 people on that subscribe to that particular one, which is impressive. Um, and by the way, it's not just online either. This is uh, the ex-Muslims of North America, an actual nonprofit group that says, this is the group we want to talk to. That's an incredible thing. They've put up billboards, they've made YouTube videos featuring non uh, ex-Muslims willing to speak out about their faith. This is a website for a group, actual group, called Footsteps, which helps former ultra-Orthodox Jews because to talk to them and to know what they went through is not something that is addressed by a lot of the mainstream atheists. They help you leave that community because it's a lot harder to get out of that religion than religion in general. So again, all this stuff is spreading. There are more people talking about it. You can find them all online. 
And that is going to be way more effective and potent and powerful than what we saw 15 years ago, 10 years ago. It's amazing. Um, and none of that, by the way, none of this is a knock on like the large nonprofit atheist groups. I love those groups. I was a part of those groups. But again, when you're one group, you can't be everything to everyone. You do have other powers, which I'll talk about in a second. There's a reason those groups are still effective and important, but they can't speak to everyone in their language. These people can, that is a big change. Um, and again, I think politicians know this. How do you really get people to vote for you and like you? It's not like a campaign ad. That's a broad brush, I hope you see it and I hope you like me sort of thing. But if you really want to change votes, especially in a local election, you get people knocking on doors, having conversations. Hopefully your friends talk to their friends and talk about you because they know you, because they form a bond with you, and that's the way you can actually convince people to change minds about any issue. And that's kind of what's going on a lot more now. So between like podcasts, YouTube, TikTok, theologians, like there's so many more opportunities for people to hear criticism of their religion than ever before, but none of them on their own necessarily are that splashy. You won't hear about them. They're not making like Amazon top lists or anything, but so many more are out there. Um, one last thing on that front. One of the downsides of this like branches of atheism that go in all these different directions is that you're gonna find some branches that make you, be, that make you think like, this is bad. <laughs> like, cause that happens with any movement. It grows and then you're like, wait, who are those people over there? They're in our group, but like, they're the ones that don't seem to share anything with everyone else. I'll give you one example. This is a right-wing atheist group that has formed. This is their big thing. They were fighting for the right of atheists to get out of mask mandates at work, vaccine mandates at work. They said, if you give a vaccine exemption to the evangelicals, you've got to give it to the atheists which sounds like they're saying like, well, if they get to pee in the pool, we should all get to pee in the pool. It's like, if you want to fight for equality, you could just say, no exceptions, stop peeing in the pool. No, they're going for the everyone gets to pee argument. I don't get it. Um, but I also don't want to, like, this happens with a growing movement. You find people where you're like, I have questions about why you are doing the things you do, but that's also a sign that this movement is growing so big, you get weird branches going everywhere. It's very interesting. Um, okay, that was the second thing that gives me hope. That you have all these flowers blooming. It's great, there's so many of them. Um, most of the time. Here's the third thing that gives me hope, which is that so many of, it used to be that if you were an atheist and you care about this stuff, you were insular, you had to work amongst other atheists because you didn't have a lot of allies. Have you all heard like there were surveys, atheists are the least trusted people in the country or the least likable or whatever it is. Um, and here's the thing, nowadays, that doesn't seem to be the case, not on those surveys, but by and large, a lot of religious organizations and other groups are happy to work and bring atheists into their fold, which I would say is a good thing. This is like, this is a, uh, an amicus brief that was filed in that big abortion case that the Supreme Court is gonna decide. This is a brief that was filed on the way that that case made its way up to the Supreme Court. And I only want to point out this thing. Look at who signed on to this particular set of arguments that they were trying to make to the judge, saying, hey judge, here's how we see this case. We hope you will agree with us. Look who's signing on to this. Americans United for Separation of Church and State, great. American Humanist Association, okay. Ben the Ark, a Jewish Partnership for Justice, and Interfaith Alliance Foundation. That's a coalition you don't see all the time, but it's like, hey, we're all on the same side of this. So like, listen to us. Here's another case that uh, involves like a Christian flag being hoisted outside Boston City Hall. And again, I just wanna point out one thing. This is the next page of this thing. Who's signing on to this brief? I know it's hard to read, but you got, well, you have, uh, what do we have here? Hindu American Fo uh, Foundation. Jewish Social Policy Action Network, uh, Men of Reform Judaism, National Council of Jewish Women, and on the next page, same thing, uh, American Atheists, American Human Association, Americans United. Like, 
All of these groups are telling these judges, we all agree that this is why you should rule the way you, we want you to rule. And by the way, anecdotally, when I talk to lawyers who work for some of these groups, they say, like, we talk amongst ourselves all the time. This is between, like, atheist groups, church aid separation groups, and say, you know what, maybe your group is better prepared to handle this case that we all know about. So why don't you guys take that? And we'll take this one. Or maybe this is something so big that we all want to get in on this because it matters to all of us. And sometimes they say, you know what, we should start working with religious groups or other progressive allies because we're all fighting the same battle here, so let's not just keep it to ourselves. <laughs> and here's an example of that in action. This just came out earlier this year. It's a full report on the influence of Christian nationalism on the insurrection. And it was spearheaded by atheist groups. I think uh, Freedom From Religion Foundation took the hell of this. But they basically had so many essays and arguments saying, you cannot talk about what happened on January 6th without bringing up the Christian influence on what happened that day. And they make the case for it. And here's the thing, if FFRF just did that by themselves, or atheist groups just did that by themselves, it would be very easy to tune out. But they didn't. They didn't on purpose. So they actually did this. Um, they worked, I want to make sure I get this right, they worked with the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty, they worked with historians Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry, and they worked with members of Congress to put this out and get their support. And it led to coverage, this is a wire service, religion news service, they got headlines there. It made it to the Washington Post. Uh, how the Capitol attacks helped spread Christian nationalism in the extreme right. And it led to this speech on the floor of the House from Jared Huffman, who's the only representative who's, only, who's openly humanist. Again, if you haven't heard this, you're in for a treat. I just want to remind you, I know you've all seen clips of like crazy people saying crazy things on the House floor. And you probably, you may not have seen this clip. Just keep in mind, there are people who are on in Congress saying things that a lot of you have probably been thinking. And it's kind of refreshing when that happens. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to bring attention to a dangerous ideology threatening our democracy. White Christian nationalism. Most members of Congress don't even know what it means, but experts from the Freedom From Religion Foundation and the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty have studied it for years, and their new report shows this movement was at the heart of the January 6th insurrection. White Christian nationalism fuses Christianity with a rigid view of civic life, a view that true Americans are white, native-born, and conservative. On January 6th, it was the connective tissue that tied disparate groups together and propelled them to action. It's infecting our government. From members of Congress and top officials in the previous administration to the wife of a Supreme Court justice whose messages to the president's chief of staff leading up to the insurrection smacked of white Christian nationalism. Thankfully, good Americans, people of faith, and non-believers are standing up to this violent ideology. I call on members of Congress to educate themselves about white Christian nationalism and reaffirm the separation of church and state. I yield back. Familiar Jared Huffman also is one of the co-founders of the Con Congressional Free Thought Caucus, which has 17 members now and works to fight to maintain separation of church and state and support atheist rights, however they present themselves. And 16 of those members are not open atheists. It doesn't matter. They're on the side of church state separation and supporting our right to not believe and things like that. But again, this is what happens because all those people work together and not just atheist groups put this out there. Because it means more when you hear all those voices are saying this all in unison, you know what I mean? Um, here's another side of like how the activism side of things has gotten really interesting. When I got involved in this world of um, uh, atheist activism, we're talking early-ish 2000s, um, there were a lot of very passionate atheists who felt like this is the thing they wanted to work on. And like I've tried to make clear this entire talk, atheism isn't necessarily the most important thing in a lot of people's lives these days. But here's what's amazing. 
a lot of those people who began their work with atheism, church-state separation, nonprofit groups, even they are now spreading out into different worlds, which is so cool to see, because you have people working on like reproductive rights groups now. They are working on LGBTQ rights. This is uh, Sarah Blaine and Evan Clark, who used to work for a number of the atheist groups, who became campaign managers and started their own like uh, uh, counseling, I forgot the name of the word I'm looking for. They started a service to help people running for office who are openly religious, because they're like, we can help you hone your message and skills. And some of their people were successful. Um, you have one in the audience right now. Raise your hand, Sarah. <laughs> This is not an endorsement. This is me saying, I worked with Sarah in those nonprofit groups. She worked with several of them, and because she worked with them and honed those skills there, she took those values, and if, I'm speaking for you, I'm sorry. If you ask, like, what do you do with those values when you have them, it's not just, well, I want to deconvert people, no. It's saying, this is what I stand for, this is what I believe, or don't believe, and I want to use those beliefs to help other people. And by the way, I don't know if this is a purposeful choice or not, she's running for state office. If you look on her campaign website, it doesn't talk about atheism. And it shouldn't, because it's irrelevant. She's not running to tell people what to think or anything. She's saying, these are my values, I'm not afraid of them, and I want to make your lives better. Which is what all successful politicians do. Like, that's an amazing thing to see so many activists who go on to do all these different things, putting their values that used to be theoretical, like, why are you an atheist because I don't believe in this or that? Yeah, but what are you doing with that? Like, what's the humanism side of this thing? What are you doing? And they're putting it into action in different areas, which is really exciting to see. Let me give you one example of what that looks like in practice. Um, another person who ran for office, I mentioned this the last time I, I spoke to CFFC, um, is a Nebraska senator named Megan Hunt. She was an atheist, she, she is an atheist. She said she was an atheist when she ran for the unicameral legislature in Nebraska. And then if anyone asked her about it, she's like, doesn't matter why I'm an atheist. Let me tell you what I'm gonna do for you if you elect me. And she did get elected. Um, let me set the scene for you. Because uh, a couple of weeks ago, Nebraska was about to pass one of those trigger laws. Like if the Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade, what are we gonna do in Nebraska? And the law that they were gonna pass would have gone so far as to uh, ban IVF treatments. It would have punished doctors who treat ectopic pregnancies. It went so far beyond let's limit abortion, which would have been bad enough. And Nebraska is a red state. They were gonna pass this thing. They had the votes to do it. Um, but you can filibuster in the legislature unless there are 33 members of the Senate willing to override the filibuster. Megan Hunt was, uh, who's over here? Megan Hunt was against the law, but she didn't know if she had enough votes to override a 33 members saying like, no, we're gonna vote on this bill. Let me show you the speech she made. This is a clip of two different speeches she made that day filibustering this thing, but here's what her tactic was. She basically said, if this bill passes, then she's gonna use whatever little power she has as one member of the chamber to basically block every other piece of legislation all the other conservative politicians in the state wanted to pass, and they had a limited window of time to do it. She's basically saying, if you pass this, I'm screwing all of you over. <laughs> and she was hoping that would do the trick. Um, here's what she said. We will do everything that we can to make sure that this extreme abortion bill does not pass in Nebraska. Today, Christian religious extremists, let's call it what it is, are trying to pass a forced birth bill in Nebraska to cut off abortion services, including for victims of rape and incest and child abuse, with no exception for the life of the mother. It should worry us, colleagues, and it should worry us Nebraskans how often we have to debate human rights and dignity and how we have conceded that there's a debate to even have. The fact that my reproductive destiny, that my fertility, that my rights to control my own body and every other woman in this <coughs> chamber 
is even up for debate is something I can't believe we have conceded as a culture. When we talk about the rights of trans children to exist, that's not debatable. When we talk about reproductive rights and reproductive justice, that's not debatable. When we talk about marriage equality, that's not debatable. When we talk about the rights of immigrants to work and drive and go to the doctor, that's not debatable. Let people live, leave people alone, and trust people in Nebraska to do what's best for them and their families and their lives. And that we have even seeded that these questions are debatable should concern us all. Proponents of this bill have no shame left. I will cherish the time that I have worked here forever, but when I am term limited, I will probably not talk to most of you ever again. <laughs> That's just reality. You're not my friends, you're my coworkers. If you think my 11-year-old should be forced to give birth, you are not my friend. Let me explain to you how it's gonna go down if this bill moves forward today. To select file. If this moves forward, the first thing that will happen is I'll open on a motion to indefinitely postpone the election law bill that's coming up next. If this bill moves, colleagues, that bill doesn't move. In life, sometimes we go through things where we have to draw a boundary. It is healthy for me as a mother, as a rape survivor, to draw a boundary and say, if you think that my child should be forced to give birth, you are not my friend. And if I go to the pearly gates and meet your God someday, which sounds great, I hope I do. <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna get in any trouble for killing all of your bills who vote for this. I don't think your God's gonna have any problem with that. And I don't think I'm gonna see any of you there either. <laughs> They only had 31 votes. They didn't have 33 to override. <laughs> uh, so she managed to stop that bill. Uh, it doesn't mean she got everything she wanted there, but like, as we've seen, like in the past couple of weeks, I saw like a couple of different speeches like that go viral because people want to see you stand up for moral clarity, and it doesn't matter where you're coming from. Uh, she's an atheist. The uh, woman you saw uh, from, I think, Michigan this past week who went viral too, was a woman of faith who said like, you don't get to talk about trans kids the way you are here. Like that stuff matters. You see moral clarity there. That stuff makes a difference. And that's what happens when people take this thing that for a long time was stigmatized, their atheism. And they are saying, I'm not here to talk about that. That's what I'm doing. That's my thoughts. Let me tell you what I'm gonna do for you. Let me use that as a way to like guide my actions in the future. That's where we're going, and that's an argument we win every time, by and large. Uh, we don't have the numbers necessarily in every state to do that, but you have those voices out there, which is amazing. Um, so, here's the takeaway from all of this. I think, for those of you who have been atheists for a while, been active as atheists for a while, if you go back 15 years or so, I think the big fights, the big arguments we used to have is about making atheists an identifier. You would identify as an atheist, just like maybe you identified as gay. And these days, being gay, saying you're gay, I'm not saying it's not a big deal. It certainly is. But it's less of a problem in a lot of places than it used to be. The same could be said of not being non-religious in some capacity. I'm not trying to correlate those two things, but like it's becoming easier for people who are non-religious in a way that it wasn't a long time ago. And that means that all of our interests, all of our resources don't have to just focus on like step one. How do you question faith? How do you get away? How do you leave organized religion? Like the, ne the thing that makes me optimistic is where do we go from here? And there are so many ways to do that. You are seeing some of that in action. And it's almost frustrating that there are never as awesome headlines and popularity about that than there was about, oh my god, these people are saying God doesn't exist. That's a big deal. Um, but like, it seems like if you're fighting religious bigotry and religious extremism, we're not the only ones fighting that battle anymore. A lot of people are. And a lot of young people see what happens when religion runs amok, and they're sick of it. And it's not that they are atheists, 
but they don't want to be associated with that. And that, in some ways, is a victory, too, that they can separate those two things. Um, and I think that's, that's a good thing for the future. If you want to debate theology or a god, like, that's fine. But for better or for worse, it seems like when people do that these days, it's almost off the clock. This is where all the real work is going, which I think is a good thing, too. I'm going to leave you with one last thing. I was trying to think of what's the most, like, unchanging traditional thing you could think of. And I thought of crosswords, because it's a hobby of mine, I love them, and the New York Times is basically the standard bearer for crossword puzzles, and they've had the same guy in charge of them for like 30 plus years now, which means he's the guy who oversees the editing of clues, and the puzzle that goes to millions of people every day. And I wanted to show you one thing that I found interesting. There is, for people who make crossword puzzles, there is a website specifically for the New York Times that says, here is every word that has appeared in the New York Times crossword puzzle, and here is every single clue that they have had for that word. And it's really helpful because if you have like the word A-N-D, and, pretty boring word to see in a crossword puzzle, what are the clever ways people have come up with to clue that? because the word isn't impressive, so your clue better be. And I looked up, like, God is a word, three letters. It's pretty, you would see it in a lot of crossword puzzles, because it, it doesn't have weird letters in it, it has a vowel. You will see it in a bunch of crossword puzzles. Even if you know nothing else about those things, I was wondering, how did they used to clue the word God? And this is from 1994 to 1999, all the different times it came up in a puzzle, and how it was clued, and you see, like, the Almighty, that literal clue has been used four different times. Mercury or Mars. Right, okay, different types of gods. Fourth word of the Bible. Fine, but if you go through this, like, the eternal. Word on a U.S. coin. Uh, praise be to blank. Those are the ways they used to clue God in the New York Times crossword puzzle for many years. That was from 1994 to 1999. Here's how they clue God in the past five years. Check this out. <laughs> Word in the Declaration of Independence, but not the Constitution. <laughs> there is no blank higher than truth, Gandhi. Um, one of two words added to the Pledge of Allegiance in 1954. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Which is to say, like, some of that stuff might have seemed blasphemous at some point or another. But I mean, look, if the New York Times crossword puzzle thinks its players, its readers, can handle this, like, I think that's a shift that's moving in a good direction for everybody, right? Even they're not afraid of poking a little wordplay or fun at something that seems super traditional. Um, it's fun. If you want to talk crossword puzzles, I'll bore you for hours. Uh, later. <laughs> um, I'm going to stop there. Uh, happy to take questions. If you have any questions now or later, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, thank you again to CFFC for having me. It's not really a question, it's just I think you've missed. Uh, one thing to be optimistic about, I'm a single parent. I have two left at home, both of them are in high school. The first time I heard about HB 1557 was from my son, who is 17 years old. One of the things that I've noticed in the past five years is that high school students, especially, are getting more involved and they're actually willing to speak up for themselves and for what's wrong with what's going on. So I think that might be something you could add. That is. That is definitely an interesting point. I, you know what? I've also seen that not just with like legislation that targets met, like their friends in some ways or their teachers in some ways. I've also seen it where even things that used to be, it seemed to me, like the under God thing in the pledge, that used to be like an atheist battle. And yet in the past several years, that shifted to a lot of uh, black children saying, I'm not saying a pledge that says we have liberty and justice for all when we don't. And like, again, this issue that used to be a pet cause for a certain segment of atheists, it's like, a, it's now being challenged in a different way, in an arguably more understandable way by a lot of people too. But you're right, like, a lot of younger people, certainly anecdotally I've seen, are so much more tuned in 
to, to politics and religion and a lot of issues that I don't feel like I was, at least speaking for myself, when I was their age. I just noticed that with, especially with, you know, the, the sit-ins are more, they, they protest more, they, they're actually more involved. Yeah, they're, they're just active in so many more ways, which is exciting to That's see. Because we've got so many older white Christian people in government that are making the laws right now, and we know that people coming out of high school and through college are the ones that are going to replace those people. And it's very optimistic to me to see that the people coming out of high school and colleges and whatnot are more in tune with, yeah. uh, you know, secular morality. Right if, if I can add to that, you're talking about secular morality and the, the high school students in that age, like, taking charge, being active, caring about these issues. So I'm coming from Illinois, very blue state. I'm coming to here, which is a very red state. Um, but, so you will see this more than I do, which is uh, so many young people fighting against all that stuff, coming up with creative ways, too, to fight against a lot of what they see as fundamentally religious, like faith-based bigotry in a lot of these bills. And I would hope that a lot of those people, some of them at least, are going to go to school or not or whatever, but they decide, here's what I'm going to do to fix that or make it better, whether it's running for office, run, uh, taking on a career that works to uh, right those wrongs, things like that. And I mean, that's a good thing for, I would hope, everybody. Yeah, thanks for that. Are you on TikTok? And if not, why not? No, <laughs> you haven't seen me dance. <laughs> you know, <it's, laughs> there are, it, it takes a certain level of creativity that I don't think I possess, and I'm not saying I wouldn't do it. Really? It's more like I barely figured out YouTube a little bit. And even then, it's like if you've seen my stuff, it's a very limited form of YouTube knowledge. Trying to do good enough to do TikTok is like, do I need to? I don't know. But I will say, here's the upside to what you're saying. Um, for anyone in any media who does this stuff, they find audiences. Like, I started a podcast years ago, and people listen to that who never would read my site. I did YouTube. There are people who watch those videos that wouldn't know me from anywhere else. So there is definitely like this pull, like, here's the thing that a lot of people are using. How are we communicating our ideas on that medium? And if people can do it well, oh my, like, please try, please do it. I don't, I don't necessarily know that that's my wheelhouse, but it's not a bad idea. And again, for people who use it regularly and have a point of view on stuff, I hope they use it however they know. I don't know the landscape as well as I do the things I already do. That's why I haven't yeah, got it yet. Yeah. Uh, how is the movement doing outside the country? So how is the movement outside the country? So, let's see. Off the top of my head, I mean, a lot of countries have grown more secular over time to the point where they look at the United States and they're like, what is going on over there when it comes to religion? Um, there are places where it's still bad, but here's the thing, here's what I will tell you. There's a lot of international cooperation when it comes to religious extremism. Um, blasphemy laws, for example, which is a pretty universally condemned thing. That used to be, in my head at least, it used to be an atheist issue, like we gotta stop blasphemy laws in all these places. But when you see high profile arrests or assassinations of people who are accused of blasphemy, like it's not just one group doing that. You have international groups working to provide legal help, uh, fight against it, change laws in certain countries where that sort of thing is possible, and they get the support of secular, like literally secular, like the U.S. government's uh, Religious Freedom Foundation group. I'm sorry, like that's one of the people in charge of that is a Christian nationalist, Tony Perkins. He's on the leadership group of that because Trump appointed him there. They're saying, yeah, the blasphemy laws are insane. We need to get rid of them. We oppose what this other country has done to this person. So in some ways, like, the, the battles are still being fought, but like, it is really hard to control communication like in places where they are theocracies, because even there, there are people who have access to a lot of material. There's a, uh, a group that works to translate atheism books in native languages in other countries because they want them, and they, just distribute it for free online so people can read it and challenge themselves and learn about this stuff because you know you can't do it overtly. They'll get in trouble if they get caught. And they have ways of communicating that information. So in terms of getting information out, it's good. 
in terms of like overall secularization, it's been happening for a while, certainly in Europe, um, but it, it seems to be happening. But there are still like, there are always religious battles even in secular countries. Uh, some of the things I've seen them fight for is making sure if people are not religious, but like churches, they have a national church, so they get taxpayer funding for those churches. They fight to make sure that the next census, people stop saying they're religious. So that those churches don't get money when you might say like, what are, what's your religion? I'm Christian, because that's what they've always said. They're like, but if you don't believe in it, and you don't attend, and you don't really care, say other. Say you don't believe in this stuff. We don't care if you say atheist. Just choose this other option. They've actually, I think in Ireland, they fought to change the census question so that other was the first option on the list <laughs> instead of the one at the very bottom, just so more people who felt that way could do it. I mean, it's interesting to watch those other fights take place. Um, I don't know if this is going to make total sense, but you, to talk to you you're about like visibility of atheists, perhaps you could talk about like the online sources being that we're not, it's not that we're as um, visible as we used to be because we've kind of gone on to an online presence. And I thought maybe you could talk about that because so much of what you're saying is maybe we're not as popular as we were visibly, but if we look online, I mean, what are our best options to like grow so that we're actually out in public and on the street? So it depends on what the goal of growing would be. If it's to grow like a group membership or something, that's hard. If it's to challenge people's ideas so that they themselves think like, okay, I don't subscribe to the religion I was raised in, there, you, you can find those challenges everywhere, which is, I think, the big change that I've seen. So, like, the cool thing is there's no religion that seems untouched. Like, there are critics of them all. There are, it's easy to find books on this stuff. It's easy to find videos. You can find all that. So in that sense, there are, all of that is out there for people just willing to look. I, I think I said this before, but like I used to Google Google questions about God's existence or like the predecessor to that. And now a lot of people might search for things on TikTok or YouTube, like what happens if I don't believe in God? And they look on there to see what are people saying about this and can I connect with this person I'm watching? Because maybe I'll listen to the other things they're gonna say. So again, in that sense, that stuff is out there more than ever. That is growing. Are you asking like how can like groups grow at all? How can we like take this from being an online, oh sorry. And make it in person? Yeah, how can we grow the movement in a sense that we become more visible because you're talking about us becoming less visible over time because these popular like major titles and major personalities yeah. aren't out there as much. Yeah. So sense. I'll go back to what I said at the beginning which is why is it necessary for the groups to grow? If it's to fight against like whatever a local government is doing, the way to do it is get people on board with like the cause in itself. This is what I talked about, like the abortion rights, gay rights, uh, trans rights, all that stuff. That goes beyond, I mean, atheists are by and large on one side of that issue, but on the issue itself, that's not an atheist thing. That you can get a lot of support for. And that's what a lot of I've seen the national groups doing, where they're like, we want to fight this reproductive justice battle, not because we care if you agree with the atheism thing or not, but because as humanists we care about this thing. Who's on board with us? And it turns out there's a lot of allies that way. And you end up getting a lot of support on those causes. Not so much the atheism thing, because a lot of people might still have issues with that. But you find the common ground, you bring them to that. And over time, like if your group is working towards something big, like American Atheists just held their conference like a week ago, their focus was fighting Christian nationalism. That is not an atheist-specific thing, though they have a vested interest in it, but they, why did they do that? Because that's something a lot of people would agree with, not just them. That seems to be as good of a tactic as I can think of to try to bring more people to what the work you're doing. Um, and it's the same reason like groups like this one do like volunteer work and do other stuff. Yes, it's a good thing, but also no one's gonna have a problem with this. If you like the work we're doing, like come join us. There's some more to that. I mean, that always seems to be the best way to grow any group if there's no, if billboards aren't working, if you can't get, if no one's writing about you or putting your name in the public spotlight or something. Um, is Christian nationalism actually growing or are they just more noisy and emboldened? No, it's a great question. 
the like the number of fundamentalists, like conservative Christians, is shrinking, but they still have a lot of power. And that is the concern because the Christians who might be in the bubble to fight against it, a lot of them have left. So what you have left, like a lot of churches are decreasing in numbers. They're fighting to get attendance in churches. They can't get it. This is like terrifying religious leaders across the board. But yeah, a lot of those churches are dying, but the ones that take a like more Christian nationalist approach are growing. Like it, it's not a it's not like they're leaving the weak churches and going to those ones. That's not the issue. But it, it turns out the ones who are like, I know the answer. I can speak loudly about it. Like, and they mix religion and politics, and they insist that the world is out to get you, and they preach persecution more than anything else. They are drawing people. So it's an overall loss. Like religion as a whole is decreasing. But the, within that group, the ones that seem to be growing are the ones that basically say, we have all the answers. The answer is, the world sucks, we're awesome, come join. <laughs> like, those ones are growing. Now the question is, can you unite everyone else outside of that group to fight against that? And it's really hard to do. Um, but I don't know if that answers that question. Like, Christian nationalism as a thing, it's easier to identify, I think, in ways because we're not blaming Christianity for that. Because a lot of good Christians are fighting against that. They're on our side when it comes to fighting Christian nationalism too. So like, it's kind of easier to make that the enemy, that specific brand of it. Because that's something everyone can get on board with. The question is, can we get enough people riled up about it to do something? That's a hard, that's a much harder thing to accomplish. Right. Well, what's more dangerous politically lately? What's more dangerous politically? It is more dangerous politically, yeah, because it's a smaller movement, but it's it's a powerful one, yeah, and they're all united on like those key issues. Someone actually said this. Um, I heard this argument the other day. Like, this person who's fighting for like conservative Christian arguments or something, they have X number of followers. Me meanwhile, like the ones on the other side have a lot fewer. Or I've heard the same thing. Like Fox News gets more viewers than anyone else. MSNBC does not, but it's not an apples to apples comparison because if you are like really conservative, there are certain voices and places you go to, whereas if you're on the other more liberal side of things, you don't have to watch Maddow. You don't have to listen to one person. Like someone made fun of like, oh, you guys don't have Biden stickers on your car or something. It's like, yeah, why would we? It doesn't matter. Whereas if you're on the other side, it's much more, it's smaller, but it's visible. And the thing is, like, this is the hard thing about elections, too. How do you get everyone united when it's such a big tent and everyone has different concerns versus another side that is very monolithic on so many things? Yeah, there's less of them, but they're all very united. How do you gather all the other people? Like, that's the, that's the problem. I wanted to put a plug in, and, and I, was, I was hopeful that there would be an opportunity to do this. This was touched on in one of the many, many points made by Jonathan Haidt in an article that just released this week in The Atlantic called Why the Past Ten Years of American Life Have Been Uniquely Stupid. And he, he talks about the, the, the number of, of, of progressives on one side of that particular spectrum and the number of evangelical conservatives on the other side. And so I wanted to make sure folks hear about that. It's in The Atlantic. It's free online. Um, so take a look at that. It's, it's, you can't miss it. Jonathan Haidt. And you were next. I, it's, while you're mentioning that, I think if you, I saw some survey, I think it's like 26% of America is like white evangelical, 26% uh, are non-religious, and 26% were Catholic, who are pretty half divided. Like one side is conservative, the other is pretty liberal. Um, and the thing is like one of those groups has all the power. And how do you get all these other people on the same uh, side, it's really hard, and people are, I mean, there's so many people trying to figure that out. It's hard to do it. I mean, again, I don't want to make this necessarily a political thing, but this is kind of what the 2016 election was. It's, you have a lot of people united behind one candidate, and a lot of liberals who hate all these, so many fighting factions, and like, I say this as someone personally who voted for Joe Biden, I don't necessarily love the guy. But people were pretty united against the other side, and that actually brought a lot of people together who might not have otherwise cared so much. 
but it's a constant battle. Same thing with religion, too. Yeah, there's fewer evangelical, white evangelical conservatives fighting this thing, but it's so hard to get everyone else on the same ship. It's, it's hurting cats at, like, a giant scale. <laughs> Uh, where might you see street epistemology, if at all, in the mix of optimism? So street epistemology is basically like you're going to like random people on the street and saying, how do you know something is true? What's some belief you hold? What do you feel like? Do you believe in God? How strongly do you believe in God? I'm not here to convert you. Let me try to ask you questions about why you're so certain about it. And maybe by the end of our conversation, you're a little less certain. Right? That's kind of what you're talking about? Yes. And so that methodology, I've seen it on YouTube through a few different people where they're just trying to have those conversations, talking about it. I don't necessarily know if like the phrase is necessarily popular, but the idea of like just asking people how they know something is true, having those conversations, it's kind of hard to avoid them if you participate in those spaces and you're willing to have the conversation. In that sense, it's great. I don't know that street epistemology itself has gotten anywhere, because there's usually like a couple of people who do it and make a big deal about it, and it's nice, it's interesting. There's a guy who made videos, a lot of them, um, for years, and then when they move on to other things, it's, I don't know, I haven't seen them lately. Yeah, I'm just curious, the, the, the degree to which it has the influence. I mean, it's a Socratic approach to questioning how you came to believe a thing and can you justify it. And, uh, and there's a famous guy, uh, Dan, uh, Truth Wanted is his, yeah. his, his deal. And he had that one with uh, Magna Bosco and some yeah. time later, yeah. Yeah, I, again, I don't know if the, the thing itself does the trick, but I do know like there, if you're looking for that sort of conversation or you are seriously interested in theology, philosophy, whatever, trying to figure out why you know something is true, there are so many, like I said earlier, so many outlets for you to be challenged or learn about it. And I mean, I hope that feeds into people questioning themselves and not always being so sure of everything. Thank you, Hammett.